Awesome. Thank you so much. So right next to me, we have Abigail, who's a senior advisor at FMO. Um, next, we have Benji, who's CTO and co-founder of Aerobotics. Um, and last, we have Alison, who's managing director at Endeavor South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. So Benji, I'd like to start with you. Um, we were tracking the investments in uh, agri-tech and food tech startups. And I know you've also been able to secure um, a significant amount of financing, around 27 million to date. But what's interesting is you've been able to secure financing um, during some tumultuous times. So you secured financing when the industry was still nascent. Um, and you also secured financing at the height of the pandemic. So as a startup fund, I wanted to understand what has it been like fundraising for you? Sure. Um, thanks, Lucy. So, yeah, we, we started the company Aerobotics about eight and a half years ago um, in South Africa, which I think was quite early, uh, I guess, in the, the context of the technology we were building, um, which is it's drones and computer vision and, and, and stuff like that, and, and ag tech in general. And, I mean, our plan initially wasn't to raise venture capital. To be honest, we didn't even know what venture capital was when, when we started the company. Um, and James and I started the business and just, just went about building. Um, so for about a year, um, we built, built our first version of the product. We got about 15 paying customers um, and then decided we were going to go to market to try raise. And very, very difficult back then. We went around probably the whole South African um, sort of VC space, got rejected by everyone. Um, the typical sort of response was come back when you guys have 100 paying customers, um, when you've got in excess of a million dollar ARR, etc. And I mean, our thought was kind of like, if we get to that point, why would we need, need you? Um, eventually, we landed on a couple sort of true seed um, investors in 40i and the Savannah Fund out of Tanzania that I think actually understood seed investing. Um, and from then, it's been a whole lot easier. I think um, the space has evolved, for one. We were able to build a bit of a presence, grow our customer base, um, and kind of rode that wave over the next few years, getting the likes of um, Endeavor and, and FMO, et cetera, to invest as well. Um, recently, through COVID and now, sort of what, what's happened over the last six to 12 months, things have become quite a bit more difficult again. I think fortunately for us, like, Food security, if anything, is more important than it's ever been. Um, the sector that we're in, in making farming more efficient, more viable, um, is almost more important than, than before. And we've been able to kind of get through these, these periods by making sure that the, 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 the business and the, the premise of the business is kind of recession-proof to some extent. Having said that, it has been difficult with the shift, especially now, away from growth and towards sort of sustainability. Uh, thank you so much. And just on the point of sustainability, I think Alison coming in as both um, an investor and accelerator, we were having this discussion on how to make the startup ecosystem more sustainable and having startups, you know, uh, considering uh, just going beyond financing. So what is the approach that you feel startups should take to ensure that, you know, they're sustainable even after securing financing? Right. Sure, and I want to say, if, if, uh, if everyone knew the, the answer to that question, I think probably none of us would be here in the room. But, I mean, I want to say when you think about that specific question, on how do you, you know, what do you do now that you've got your financing? And I think Benji alluded to it really well. You've got to take into consideration exactly who's the investor set that's out there. So who are the seed investors that will invest in your, in your segment? Know exactly who the investors are that will be at your pre-Series A, in your Series A and later. So you really understand who those investors are and then what you. And again, like you just called out, sustainability is a really, really important topic now. So as investors, they're all looking for returns. So you've got to get those commercial returns. But then many investors are looking for, you know, something more. So if you are, you know, knowing and understanding who your investors are and say, this team is really keen on food security as well as gender, as well as really uplifting um, certain, certain individuals in certain countries, you know, you're going to be much more successful in accessing that financing. So I think I want to say we as Endeavor, what do we try and do in this space, just 
is try and assist with making it really clear to the entrepreneurs which investors are in those spaces. So who are the angels? Who are there to support you in the pre-series A rounds? What are they looking for? What are their mandates? What do they need? And it's not that easy to, to navigate that um, investor landscape for you as an entrepreneur because you're busy growing your business and now you need to spend all this time trying to understand which investor is the right investor for you and who's going who's gonna to fit with your mandate. So if you have got good clarity on the investor landscape, I think you'll also be much more realistic about who, how you're going to be growing your business because you'll grow your business to match the funding that's actually available. And with that, you'll build a much more sustain your business in a much more sustainable fashion. And then, of course, we get uh, cycles in the markets. So we've had some amazingly good years in the VC space where money has been you know, re readily accept accessible. And now the market's tightening. So investors are looking for something different in your unit economics. And now's the time, if you've built good, trusted relationships with your existing investors on the cap table, you know, you're going to be reaping the rewards from having those, those great relationships. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Um, now over to you, Abby. Um, I know you also, FMO is also an investor in aerobotics. So which other technologies apart from um, agrobotics are you excited about? Or which other technologies would you want to see more funding going into? Thanks. Yeah, I think maybe the first thing to say is just that it's really exciting that there's this much attention on the ag tech space. Because I think just 10 years ago, it was 3 billion invested globally. Um, and then just last year, as we saw in the report, this is 500 million for, for Africa alone. So, I mean, it's, it's picking up, and that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, I think. You know, what we're seeing maybe in other parts of the world and other more developed markets is around like e-groceries and deliveries. Um, that's, that's not necessarily the, what we're looking at and what's most important in, in Africa. It's, we've got to look at the sort of full supply chain and I think solutions around supply chain management and more upstream at sort of smallholder farmer level, that's where we're starting to see some, some real innovation and some opportunities. So we um, actually work with Endeavor as well on an agri-tech accelerator. So we put out a call for applications and we saw a lot of digital marketplaces and we those kind of business models coming out. So that's really exciting. Um, but I think also sort of beyond that, even like really at that farmer level, providing technologies that can support with that access to all important inputs, um, helping to make them more affordable, available at the right time, um, solving some of the logistical challenges. Uh, that, that's where we're really keen to see um, some more innovations in that space and, and, and target. And I think that's where there's also this cross-cutting opportunity around climate. And I think that's come up a lot at this event, but around climate tech and being able to build that right kind of advice in at farmer level, climate adapt, about quite vulnerable you know, population here. So, so any kind of improvements that we can get in this, this space and to scale it will be future. Maybe, can I just build on that? And I, sure. I want to say something that came up in your report as well, which is really interesting to see, is, you know, fintech, we, first the telcos moved, then everyone had access to, to, to data, then the fintechs, you know, get the payment rails and the payments in place, and then people can actually transact. And it's been really interesting to see the growth in the ag tech space now that there are some interesting fintech solutions. And I want to say just if you think about FMO and your verticals, you focused on fintech, ag tech, and climate tech, and there's some really interesting complementary, um, I want to say, services that are offered across these. And, I, and it's exciting to see the entrepreneurs are starting to, to pick up on those. And I would say, I mean, aerobotics, you can also speak to that because that's something that you guys do for the farmers. So. And you know, Benji, uh, there's something I want you to speak about as a founder. So I know Aerobotics is um, headquartered in South Africa, but a lot of your clientele is based um, in other continents. So what do you think, um, or what, do you, what would you say has taken to demonstrate that an African uh, startup can serve international markets? So... Yeah, I mean, building the business in South Africa was a very deliberate decision for us. Um, when we started, James, my, my co-founder and our, our CEO, was at MIT in the States, and, and I was in the UK. And we, we saw an opportunity to come back here and, and build the business, and it was for a couple of reasons. One, one being, just from a technical perspective, access to talent 
um, we believed that we could get access to people uh, um, of as high a caliber, if not higher than we were getting exposed to offshore, and obviously for a much more affordable price. Um, at the same time, we could build the business in a much less saturated market with, with, with less competition in sort of developing the, the, the product out. Um, and I think in, in the industry that we were in, in, in agriculture, the, the, the couple sort of points that, that uh, justified building the business here, one of which is there's real uniformity in the problems that growers are facing all around the world. Um, you're struggling with, with input prices, input scarcity and in fertilizer, water, labor. Um, and and the, the kind of solutions to solving those problems are also quite similar. Um, Additionally, there's, there's obviously seasonality. We, we focus in the permanent crop space, so it's fruit and nuts, and just between the northern and southern hemisphere, there, there's obviously seasonality to balance. And we thought it made a lot of sense to come to South Africa, use South Africa to some extent as a laboratory to test with some of the best growers in the world. Um, this technology, it's quite a sort of tech-savvy industry locally. Um, almost use it as our laboratory and then take it offshore in the off-season locally and, and the, the, the season internationally. Um, we've also been helped with the context of, um, especially from a South African perspective, farming and, and agriculture as an industry here is really well respected, um, especially in the crop types that we focus on around the world. Um, and in an industry where trust is so important in, in growing your customer base, we've been able to leverage that um, in markets like the United States, Australia, etc., as well. Um, so I really think it's, it's been a huge benefit for us, sort of building this off the continent, um, especially when we look at, at some of the companies we're up against, which are um, some from Silicon Valley, from Israel, etc. And just from day one, you're competing in a, a much more saturated space. Well, Abi, you know, um, from what Benji has said, um, he notices that there are a lot of similarities in the challenges that farmers face that African startups are solving on the continent. But then when you look at the investment trends, um, agri food tech is still not getting as much financing as compared to other sectors like fintech and health tech. Like, what would you say um, is the reason in your opinion? Um, well... I, th I think it, I guess it is a bit of a newer space compared to some fintechs and like the, you, you have with the agri-tech still a bit of the uh, dilemma in a ventures category around the fact there's a lot of physical infrastructure in some of these models, so, so stores and, and warehouses and things, so maybe uh, you're not seeing those like scalable high growth rates that you're seeing in fintechs um, or at least over the last five years. but. Uh, so this word fidgetal has come out, right? So it's a bit of a hybrid maybe of some of the traditional kind of capex and infrastructure and technologies. Um, uh, so, that, so that's sort of one reason maybe that uh, you're not getting as much VC funding. But I think with um, entities like, like FMO, I mean, we, we are looking at some of those um, models as well and through different instruments, right? Like around uh, debt side of the business was also looking to kind of graduate some more of those sustainable growth models and not just the kind of rapid growth models. And I think that came up yesterday also around, um, you know, maybe how VC might be different in, in Africa is it's not just that you're looking for the one or the two unicorns out of 10. Um, you are looking for maybe six of the companies to just to grow and to grow well. It's not that you have to have this kind of 80-20 um, model. So, so I think sort of changing some expectations, investor expectations about what, what can be achieved from this vertical, um, but also not getting too siloed into the verticals. I was at a FinTech for Inclusion Summit last week, where one of the questions that was asked was like, can FinTech solve like climate challenges? Um, and actually the answer from the room was like, mm, disagree, right? Because it's not just any one sort of solution that's going to solve these complex challenges. We need we can look at things like fintech or embedded finance through agri-tech models um, that could uh, solve things, especially at, at ground level with farmers and see some of the changes that we're looking for. So I think maybe that's also what we might see attract more investment is when you're seeing the, not these vertical silos. And Alison, back to you. Um, I would like to understand more about how 
you know, Endeavor is helping advance the, um, like the ag ecosystem. No, sure. And I want to say, Abigail spoke to that um, a little bit earlier, but there are really two parts to Endeavor. The one side is the sort of business acceleration, where we lever leverage our global um, pro bono mentor network to offer tailor tailored and on-demand mentoring to the businesses or you know, high growth businesses that are at an early stage. And we've partnered with FMO for the past year um, to work with 10 really early stage businesses across Africa to, to do just that. And it's one giving those teams accessing to some of the, the best mentors um, across the African continent and also internationally. Primarily, we focus on entrepreneurs who've sort of been there and done it before. So, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the guys from the aerobotics team, um, Stuart in particular, has been really um, generous with giving his time on how they went about their seed and uh, pre-series air raising as aerobotics, sharing this type of information with the teams that we work with across Africa. Likewise, putting in entrepreneurs like, like Apollo from Kenya, um, Agtrace from Brazil, and really just cross-pollinating the learnings and advice from entrepreneurs who've been there and done in other segments. Um, and then the second part is on um, really providing capital. So our Catalyst, Global Catalyst Fund is, has invested in aerobotics, and we've got a local fund here, but what, is that fund, what are those funds looking to do? They're looking to really put liquidity into these markets. They follow funds. We don't lead rounds, so we work hard to try and encourage investors like FMO, Africa Invest. Um, you can list the, the, the list of ag investors in, in Africa to lead the rounds for entrepreneurs where there's a great fit, and then we as Endeavor will come in behind them to look to close that round more quickly so the entrepreneurs can get back to business and grow their funds. So, yeah. so yesterday um, at a certain panel, what came out is um, that investors feel like startups are not really um, there yet when it comes to having great pitches. And I know this is something that you see a lot, like coming from the accelerator and the investment side. Um, so what would you say are startups getting wrong when it comes yeah. to pitching? I want to say, you know, that's one very general question, so I'll, I'll try my best to, to answer it. But it's so much easier to pitch if you pitched a good few times before and got investment because there's no better way than learning how you need to, to pitch, you know, is learning from experience. But my best advice to entrepreneurs when they're pitching is, you know, make sure you've got a phenomenally credible and compelling story. And I mean, I know it sounds like really theoretical and know exactly what your investor on the other side of the table is looking for. Go there to the table knowing these are the last 10 investments that, that this investor has made. These are the follow-on rounds that they've made. Why have they made those, those investments? They've made those investments for this reason. Okay, then you'll be talking about your business, but you'll be putting it in the eyes of the investor. So you'll know, okay, they're looking for this type of return, but hey, they're also looking for this type of impact. And just make sure then you've got your story straight that it's actually going to fit with the investor on the other side of the table. And step one is like investor, they're looking for commercial returns. So just make sure that comes across your, your market size, how you're going to be delivering commercial returns in the future. Um, so you've got to prove out your business model. And, but I want to say really important to know what your investor is looking for who's sitting on the other side of the table. Yeah. Great. I think at this point, I would like to open the floor to a QA. and a is there anybody with a question? Yes, we have a gentleman right here. We have two questions. Please state which panelist you're addressing the question to. Thank you. Sure. My name is Steve. I'm from Benin in West Africa. I'm CEO and co-founder of AfriCereal Group, that a company specialized in the renting machine for producer and making farmer to market. My question is, uh, according to you, what lesson, what lesson can, can be learned from investing in agri-tech in Africa? What lesson can be learned? You're asking, who, who you're asking, just so we know. Is that anyone? I think. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to check, are you asking what can be learned for the entrepreneur or what can be learned for the investor? Investor. As an investor. An investor, be patient because it's going to take longer for all the reasons that Abigail called out. Right? The ag techs are often 
They're not pure fintech, like when we talk about fintech players, those are incredibly scalable over a relatively short period of time with not that much fixed assets um, that you need to invest in. When you're talking about the ag tech sector, there are typically lots of physical products that are, and movements that need to happen. So what does that mean? That means that your unit economics are going to be really different in that business. And also, you know, maybe you're going to have to need a combination of financing, so it won't be pure equity, because potentially there's some assets in that business that you can use some interesting debt models to also, or debt financing to support. So I'm going to say, as an investor in general, with ag tech, you need to be more patient, because, you know, on, on average, it is, is going to take longer, because of that mix that Abigail spoke through. Um, and then also, I want to say, really know the business that you're investing in, because almost the same those, that same list of things are called out for the entrepreneur. The investor know that entrepreneur. So, and be really realistic about what can be achieved and what, what you know, is, is not realistic and also how you can help. Because as an investor, you've got an amazing role in addition to providing capital of what you can do for that entrepreneur. And, and do it because it will grow the value of the business and therefore your investment. Um, maybe I'll pick up on that on maybe two ways that we are supporting um, some of the agri-techs uh, we've invested in and, and, and what I see as being maybe linked to the trend around embedded finance as well. So at a certain point with this marketplace model or once you've got a, a large user base of farmers, there's going to get that question of is this the platform through which you start lending right, and access to finance and then you start meeting fintech and, um, and what quickly becomes an issue. I mean, you didn't set up to solve that problem, right? You set up maybe to solve logistics or advisory, but now you're in finance. So I think as an investor, like we can maybe fast track some of the really critical kind of uh, skills transfer from the fintech space into agritechs and or partnerships, right? With, with banks or entities that could be lending through the agritech platform. Um, because things like credit scoring are, are really obviously critical um, in terms of making that, that, that lending model work. So um, I think it's a really exciting opportunity for agritechs to get into the, the financing space, but it's also you know, something that shouldn't be, it's not easy. Um, and so maybe trying to sort of borrow from some of the places where they've solved that. And the other thing I think for, for Africa, what's quite interesting is not to look necessarily at like Europe or American models um, because we're solving different problems here. But, but India has some really interesting agri-tech models that are scaling. Um, there's a company called Dehart that we work with that now has like 1.2 um, million users on its platform. And it's doing all of these kind of integrated services around advisories and, and inputs and, and now starting with finance as well. So is there some sort of like, if, as an investor, like the knowledge exchange that we can facilitate between you know, Africa and, and Asia on, on that front with agri-tech models? Great. Um, there was a gentleman on the left. The mic is on. Yeah. I think it was the volume. Um, it's Timmy Suzwane, uh, co-founder of GoGeta Africa, which is an equity-based crowdfunding platform. And um, from where I'm sitting, I just want to find out what your typical ticket sizes are in the space from the investments that you, both of you have made um, um, going forward, uh, or sorry, previously. And then also, what, what typical durations do you have for those investments? So what is your investment life cycle for these companies typically? So I can go, I can go first because ours is a rules-based fund, so it's a much easier question to answer for our catalyst, global catalyst fund and our harvest fund. So our global catalyst fund, um, what's the size of that fund? It's close to $300 million, our fourth fund. What check sizes do we write? We, we get into, uh, we write $2 million check sizes, so they're not, you know, massive, but we'll invest in any round that's greater than $5 million, given that that entrepreneur is part of the broader Endeavor network. And then what we saw quite quickly here in South Africa and for the other African markets is that there are many rounds that the entrepreneurs we were working with here that were smaller than $5 million. So with that, we set up our Endeavor Harvest Fund. We did the first test fund, just, just really learning from our Global Catalyst Fund, which has been around for 10 or 12 years. We set that up beginning of last year, 200 million rand, so you know, 12, 13 million dollars. And there, the check sizes are much smaller. We'll write checks there between um, $250,000 up to um, $750,000, so, so smaller. 
and that's because we're trying to get in earlier and we, we're not wanting to squeeze out investors. We want to find the right lead investor, take a small slice in the round to, to close the round earlier, but enable like, really VC markets to also grow at the same time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so with the Ventures program, you can invest a like, minimum ticket size, 500,000. Uh, for equity, and then maximum exposure for one company is 10 million. And so we're expecting to have kind of multiple rounds where we continue to participate um, and top up our funding. So starting small and like growing our investment over time. Um, uh, but I think an important thing that uh, with it, as, a, as a DFI, we don't lead investments, so we need to co-invest. I think from a company perspective, making sure that that's understood and uh, really targeting uh, an investor that can of our, uh, that we can then follow into an investment. But I'd actually be interested from Benji, like your advice on raising funds from investors and like how do you do your homework on things I, like ticket size and... I mean, just, just one thing that popped in mind, like what we've often struggled with is you find a lot of people and, and FMO and Endeavor have been amazing, and AgFund actually, amazing supporters to us, but there's a lot of groups that are willing to follow in, in rounds. It's finding the lead is, is what's the most difficult. Um, and in the past, like w we almost didn't take that seriously enough in, in focusing on finding those lead investors, and there's not that many of them, yeah. depending on the sector that you're in. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's just something that popped in mind off, off the conversation now. Sorry, and the duration. Um. Oh, so the duration, standard six to eight years plus two. Okay, okay but Benji, um, because I know you get also feedback from the investors who've supported you, um, what would you say um, about aerobotics that they liked and decided to invest in your startups? Yeah, I think, Look, like the, the technology itself that we're building is, is pretty novel and the opportunity is substantial. Um, I think it's funny, uh, like thinking back to our, our initial pitch when, when 40i came on board, um, James and I were, were pitching to them, trying to sell sort of why the financials make sense, etc. cetera. And um, Justin Stanford at the time, who, who led the round, he, he said to us sort of, stop, you guys are doing a shit job. Like, just, just tell us why you started the business. Like, why you believe in this, why you've come back to South Africa, and why this opportunity is meaningful. And I think that sort of story and, and belief from our side on, on why this matters has been sort of from that round onwards what's, what's got people interested. Um, it's clear, like, farming's only becoming more difficult as, as time goes on, and this technology is only becoming more and more necessary. Um, I think... Yeah, there's a lot of aspects of, like I said, the, the building this out of Africa has been a really big um, differentiator for us as well. Um, and, and being able to build a scalable business with economics where you cost in rands and sell in dollars is, is also obviously quite attractive to, to, to investors. And um, I would say aerobotics has really been embracing visibility in the media a lot. Um, I've worked with aerobotics um, from, uh, for other reports as well for our report at AgFunder and at other media companies as well. So would you say that visibility in the media has uh, positively impacted um, how investors see you or has it helped you or placed you a step further in gaining trust from investors or even, uh, you know, securing the financing? Helped. I think, um, like I said, in, in, in getting those lead investors on board, um, what we often struggled with was not being big enough or, or prominent enough to attract that, that interest. And, and media definitely played a big role there. Um, I don't think it's, it's not something that we deliberately went after. I think luckily, like, there's a few sort of sexy angles to the business and the space that we operate in, the technology, et cetera, which, which helped. Um, I think an interesting point there is it, it helped from an investment perspective. It's helped from a talent perspective in terms of getting access to it hasn't helped that much from a commercial perspective. In, in some cases, it's almost had the opposite effect. Um, so in the agriculture space, farmers make decisions off of, of trust, off of science, etc. And I mean, just, just one example, we, we were part of a program called Google Launchpad. Um, it's 
must have been about five years ago, and it's a very prominent startup program. There was a lot of hype, a lot of media around it. We came back to South Africa, and, and the response from farmers was, like, we see you guys are a startup. You're working with Google. We don't want to work with startups. We want to work with real agriculture businesses. Mm. Um, so it's almost been quite an interesting learning to try achieve both at the same mm. time, and, and we found often that can be quite contradictory. Okay, so are you moving um, away from branding yourself as a startup? We're trying to. We're trying to focus on the science, on the sort of case studies, on really entrenching ourselves in agriculture itself. And um, look, it's a fine balance and a fine line between the two. But um, I think a lot of the, the, the media and the branding has helped us get to where we are. What's going to help us get to the next step is real substance and partnerships and working with industry it, itself. Okay, fantastic. Is there any other question? We have a question at the back. Uh, sorry, yeah, I've just got a question around the different markets for agri-tech. So I'd like Benji's view on this, but then also Alison and Abigail in respect of South African agri-tech companies focused on big commercial farmers versus a lot of the technologies that we've seen in places like East Africa, like Apollo that you've mentioned. What's the type of preference and the type of landscape of how you assess those two different markets when you're looking at companies? Um, from an FMO perspective, I'd like to understand when you're focusing on smallholder farmers, how do you think about a blended finance model? Because obviously there's also a bottom of the pyramid uh, type of thing there. And then also for Benji, when you were planning on scaling out, why the move into, um, into the US? And did you consider from a market size perspective, bigger commercial farms in South Africa and going into Zambia or Zimbabwe and some of those places. So yeah, just the, that landscape type of question. Cool. Um, yes, yeah, so, so look, we, we focus on very specific crop types. Um, it's permanent crops, high value crops, which we think the technology lends itself to in that the impact you can make sort of warrants the, the, the cost of the technology and it's, it's mostly been citrus, apples, and nuts. And we've kind of followed those crops geographically into the markets that we focus on. So that's largely been the reason places like Central Valley in, in California or the, the, the East Coast of Australia are, are kind of markets that, that we've looked at. Um, I mean, just, just one point, looking at the South African industry, something that we've learned is I mentioned earlier the farmers here are very, especially these, these sort of high value crop farmers are very tech savvy, um, which has been really great for us to sort of break through into the market. One of the challenges we faced is in, in being almost first to market in our space, we didn't understand sort of what cost that would bring with it in terms of having to educate the market and almost create the market to, to begin with. Um, and I kind of, we had this head start where we could break through and, and the tech savvy farmers helped us kind of access that quickly, but uh, compared to the United States, which we were initially very hesitant on, we thought, I mean, we spoke to a whole lot of South African entrepreneurs there and everyone kind of gave us the discovery, tried to come to the US and failed, like why, why would it work with, with you guys? Um, but we found in this industry, it was actually super ripe and, and, and ready in that there, there had been competition Farmers had been exposed to other technology and had a bit of a sense of what technology could and, and couldn't do. And really our ability to get in was more a matter of differentiating and showing why we could sort of beat the limitations that, that they were seeing with other tech. And we found that sort of repeatedly in other markets too, that sort of the slightly more developed markets have allowed us to grow and, and capture those spaces quicker. Um, I mean, just, just one other point on sort of, at least in the space that we, we focus on, we have looked at smallholder farmers and kind of smaller sized farms. It's, it's just the, the kind of lack of infrastructure and the cost of, of the technology itself we found hasn't really lended itself to what we're doing without um, some subsidization from say, the finance space or crop insurance, etc. So we've kind of focused on, on these sort of key high value crops to build this out before considering other markets. No, and I want to say almost just building on a thread of what um, Benji was calling out, and then I'll use that to, to talk through. Don't just say South Africa, Kenya, because many of the other markets are sort of much more similar. South Africa is quite a different market for, for reasons I'll call out in the agriculture space now. But the cost of educating your customer on what your product is 
as a startup is enormous. So if you can be second to market, but be better than whoever is the market leader in differentiating, that's a much more cost-effective way to, to go to market and your, your time for your clients, which is... So if you think about that, then the other sort of key thing to call out in the agriculture space is South Africa really, and this is similar across sort of all aspects of industry, we've got in South Africa, relative to many of the markets in, the, in other parts of Africa, the, the corporates are big. So here we've got very large commercial farmers and they farm a massive portion, they form a massive portion of our overall agricultural sector. There are big um, commercial farmers in other markets, but not nearly holding the same market share. And then on the other hand, the smallholder farm farming is much bigger in many of the other markets. So because of that, what you'll see is you'll see agricultural, like ag tech um, solutions in South Africa that are already targeting the big commercial farmers. Why? Because the opportunity sits there. Whereas in you know, Kenya, in the other words, you see lots of, and this doesn't only just stay with agriculture, but you see lots of B2C models, lots of marketplaces in Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, e-commerce, delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because the corporates aren't as big in those markets. So the opportunity space in the B2C is very big. Relatively speaking, in South Africa, B2B is a big opportunity because they're very large corporates. It's not saying there's not B2C, but there's also B2B. So just sort of taking that into consideration. And then from that, where's the easiest place to start? Well, you're going to start where the total market size is the biggest and the need is there. And then also knowing your investors. And I want to say for Kenya, Nigeria, you know, some of the other markets in Africa, there's a much larger pool of development capital that's available to you as an ag tech. So probably because of where your funding sits and also because of what the market looks like, you're going to choose to start in those places first, learn, and then bring your solution to, to markets like South Africa once you've built the, the B2C model in, in places like Kenya, et cetera. Okay. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. <laughs> you can please uh, connect with the panelists after this, and you can follow them on LinkedIn as well and myself. Um, thank you so much for your engagement and thank you for our panelists for your insights. Um, the session has come to an end. Thank you.